in the history of mankind this is probably the first time when uh, diagnostic industry has been in the absolute spotlight it has suddenly moved from under the carpet to over the carpet necessity the world has recognized the need for early warning systems in the healthcare segment currently for covid-19 but this trend is going to continue for all forms of diagnostics in the time to come but what will be the change in dynamics in diagnosis the post covid era and what is the way forward for digital diagnostics post covid-19 will there be opportunity more than the challenges for indian diagnostic industry i am joined by panelist dr harsh mahajan founder mahajan imaging center next dr arvind lal executive chairman dr lal path labs dr arvind kumar chairman center for chest surgery and director institute of robotic surgery at sir ganga ram hospital dr rakesh mishra director ccmb and we are joined by moderator vikas tandekar editor pharma and health etprime.com thank you all for joining us for this very important uh, panel discussion uh, as part of this uh, event on indian diagnostics industry firstly thanks uh, to all the speakers uh, who have agreed to join us for this panel discussion all of them have been so busy but you know being the stalwarts in the industry we needed them to express their views and thoughts especially in such challenging times uh, that we are facing uh so uh, to briefly introduce uh, all of them i would like to start with uh, dr arvind lal dr arvind lal uh, you know everyone knows uh, chairman of lal path labs uh, extremely successful uh, business that he has created and filled up a, a very important need gap so thank you uh, dr lal for joining us next uh, we have dr arvind kumar who has been seen in the middle of so many emergencies as part of sir gangaram hospital is the chairman institute of robotic surgery uh, thanks dr arvind kumar for joining us uh, you know you have been extremely insightful with all your comments and how you have been able to manage uh, the patient flow in such uh, extremely challenging times we have dr rakesh mishra uh, director of center for cellular and molecular biology in hyderabad Uh, one of the most prestigious research institutes but very low profile as we see in good research institutions so thanks for making time dr mishra for joining us uh, for this very important uh, uh, panel discussion and uh, uh, we have dr harsh mahajan again a uh, big name in imaging and you know we know how the world has actually shaped in terms of uh, imaging uh so uh, thanks uh, uh dr mahajan also uh for joining us so uh, briefly you know the way we will be following the format is uh, you know a very quick round of uh, initial comments which will be very brief and then uh, you know uh, having expressed your views i will take you know the conversation forward in terms of what you all feel should be the next uh, world for indian diagnostics you know having seen a complete uh, you know change in the way uh, hospitals healthcare diagnostics have seen the world in the last 6 months so uh, may i start with uh, dr arvind lal on how has it been in the last 6 months and where do you see the whole uh, agenda going because you know healthcare has suddenly become so important for all of us and you know you can actually express your views on the point of care testing on pandemic how you have been able to manage this situation uh, thank you very much for getting me here and uh, i would like to since back life was uh, you know pretty good and um, it can be always better as they say and in the last uh, say 2 to 3 months we have faced enormous challenges in uh, the diagnosis of uh, covid-19 as you know that this uh, virus did not even have a proper name earlier corona virus this virus that virus so now it has been given a, a beautiful name and uh, covid 2a or whatever and uh, it is to our credit that you know the the diagnostic industry has come up to the to the level 
And the reason I'm uh, saying this is that uh, in the 2009, you know, swine flu epidemic, which had also hit India in a very big way, at that point of time, there were hardly any government labs and there were just a handful of private labs doing it. And uh, so we have seen the, the, the steady you know, growth of uh, at least government labs. And uh, I'm also very happy to state that the, the private uh, labs in India have come you know, shoulder to shoulder helping the government. But there's no doubt about it that the government labs have definitely come of age. They are actually doing about three-fourths of the, the testing work right now than what we are doing. And uh, we would uh, wish that, you know, in every state there should be multiple such labs. So gradually, because health, whether we like it or not, is a state subject. But that's another fact of the matter that 70% of all patients are seen by the private sector. So we cannot wish either of the two sectors away. And it is to our credit that the government has now really come into the fore. And nearly 150,000 tests are being carried out every day. And this capacity has to be ramped up to nearly 5 lakh tests, if what we have you know, picked up from the, the ministers. And I'm sure that we would be able to do that. Having said that, this is not an easy test to perform. And people uh, who are already carrying out RNA virus testing, like HIV, H1N1, which is swine flu, hepatitis C, and who are approved with these kind of uh, uh, tests with the NABL have been sanctioned or given sanction for to carry out this test. At the same time, now many more labs uh, you know, are coming and getting the, the COVID-19 approval done by the NABL. And I must put on record that NABL has you know, surpassed everybody's expectations and the amount of labs they have been able to accredit in practically no time you'll hear from Dr. Mahajan, how his was done in a record time, and it's hats off to them. At the same time, I would also like to point out that the labs are far ahead than anybody else as far as quality testing is concerned. Thanks to the NABL coming in, and we have been accredited since the year 2000, and every two years there is, you know, an accredited. And uh, we would also like to put on record that none of the government labs right now are NABL accredited. And we feel very bad when somebody tells us that, well, your report is wrong. Why is your report coming positive when ours is coming negative? And they quietly forget that four or five days have passed in this time. And the technique of taking the, the nasal swabs and throat swabs could also be different. And the, the techniques in the, in the government labs are usually of, uh, they're using a different kind of a methodology what we call primers and probes, whereas we people in the private sector are using only kits. So they are not supposed to match, they shall not match. And I would also like to put on record that there is nothing known as a false positive here. If from these accredited labs, a test goes out positive, my friend, it is indeed positive. There can be a false negative, but not a false positive. So with these opening right. remarks, I hand you uh, back. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lal. Those were very important points you raised. And uh, again, the, the question of having a combined effort of state level labs with all the challenges that you mentioned about the certification and not being NABL accredited. Uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar, what has been your experience uh, you know, in dealing with the patients? And you know, where do you see these synergies between public and private establishments going? Uh, you know, especially when a pandemic like this really comes, we kind of expose a number of uh, weaknesses in the systems. Uh, Mr. Vikas, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this show. It's indeed a delight and an honor to be sharing the dais with my esteemed co-panelists, and thank you very much. Uh, as we all know, this pandemic has thrown problems of an unimaginable magnitude. While it has given us huge problems, I strongly believe that hidden inside every problem is a bunch of opportunities. And if you look back at the various uh, such pandemics or similar devastating situations like world wars, which world has faced, every time after that, as the world has tried to recover, we have come, at, come up with some 
you know, amazingly new technology or something which actually is path breaking, which can be called as a positive outcome of that negative episode. And I strongly believe that something similar is happening with Corona also. It did throw huge challenges at the whole world. The whole world actually has come to a grinding halt because of that. But at the same time, we are also realizing our weaknesses as well as our strength. Uh, you mentioned about the synergy between private and government sector. Now, unfortunately, these two sectors have been operating in silos in our country. There is not only a huge gap in the infrastructure levels between these two, but unfortunately, I don't often see any communication also or cooperation or co-working happening between these two parallel systems which are catering to the same population. But this time around, what has happened is that there is more effort at bringing about a synergy. There are positives in the government systems. Their infrastructure is larger. You know, they always have more space, more space for boards, bigger boards and all. A lot of funding coming from government. But somehow the private sector works in a far more efficient manner, giving much more output with less inputs. So I think there is, at least in this corona, today, if I'm given charge of Delhi, you know, the first thing I would do is to call a meeting of the chairpersons or directors or, you know, whoever is the in charge of every hospital in Delhi, be it big or small, be it private or, or, or government, and just tell them, friends, we are all a family. The city has a problem to face, and it is the duty of this hospital family to face this problem and save the lives of the people of the city of Delhi. Let's sit down together. Let's chalk out a strategy in which we gain from the strengths of each and each one covers the weaknesses of the other. So if I have some, suppose I have wonderful ventilators, but I don't have that much of manpower and another hospital does not have ventilator, but has a manpower of, you know, 20 residents who are not utilized. I would bring them together, give them a one day crash course and either get those residents to my place where those ventilators can be better used or may even be willing to share it with them if they think that they can manage it there. So because the need of the R is a very, very strong cooperation between the two sectors, not acting in silos, but acting as a part of one hospital family, you know, learning from each other, helping each other, hand holding each other, with one single aim, that the city has a problem. Citizens of the city are our responsibility, and it's a duty of this system to give the best care, keep the numbers to minimum, and those who do get the disease, keep the mortality of the two lowest possible, and get the city out of this mess as soon as possible. Because So now we'll, we'll jump to uh, Dr. Harsh Mahajan's uh, perspectives on how he has actually seen uh, the last few months and, uh, you know, having come out of these, not come out, maybe, you know, still confronting these challenges, uh, what could be the lessons for the future? I think we've learned a lot uh, in these last three months, probably a lifetime's worth uh, very quickly. One, we've learned that, you know, everyone has some basic resilience within. And if you look at the diagnostic industry, both from the point of view of being able to supply kits and then both the public as well as the private sector labs at being able to ramp up. When we started, we, we hardly had capacity of doing about a thousand uh, 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 tests a day and even the uh, kits were not available. But today, I believe, uh, you know, even within India, we have a capacity of about four and a half lakh kits per day. And actually, the uh, manufacturers are, uh, you know, clamoring that since their kits are not getting used, they are having to manufacture lesser, they should be allowed to actually export them. That is fantastic. This has all happened in these three, four months. The second thing is, uh, as Dr. Lal uh, has pointed out that many labs which were already testing for H1N1 were very quickly accredited by NABL to carry on 
testing for uh, COVID-19 using RT-PCR. And also some like ours, our lab is called Caring DX. And uh, we actually are a genomics lab. We have uh, next gen sequencers with us. And we were working mostly in the cancer field. But when this pandemic hit and there was need for everyone to pitch in, we decided that since we have the equipments, uh, you know, RT-PCR probably is one of the smallest equipments that our NGS lab has, we decided we would uh, want to start doing these tests and approached NABL. We were already NABL for cancer and we approached NABL and, you know, it was amazing that within five days, we were NABL accredited for uh, COVID-19 testing. And, uh, uh, you know, it was surprising. In fact, it was so such a huge, nice surprise that the entire accreditation process happened online. It was all on a Zoom kind of network. And uh, from six in the evening, after finishing their normal day's work, till 12 at night, the two examiners went through each and everything. And within two, three days after that, we got the accreditation. So this also showed a newer uh, facet that one doesn't have to be physically present all the time for accreditation to happen. And, and uh, kudos to NABL for doing it. Now, thirdly, coming to my own field, I'm a radiologist. And uh, we, we have nine uh, radiology centers, both within large hospitals as well as uh, standalone. And radiology is also playing an increasing role. We actually published a meta-analysis of 49 papers at the end of April, uh, uh, the use of CT in COVID-19. And it is very beneficial, especially for inpatients and those having uh, uh, respiratory issues where the oxygen saturation is low, both the X-ray as well as better, the CT scan are able to show the extent of disease. They are able to even prognosticate to some extent. And as we go forward, you know, we will know more and more. And also they are being able to, they are being used to determine even the kind of ventilation to be used, the position in which the patient is to be treated, be it supine, be it prone, be it uh, uh, in a decubitus position, and, and uh, also whether whatever treatment is being instituted, whether it's working or not. In the ICU setting, it has been the X-ray, which has been the mainstay, and also point of care ultrasound is playing its own role where to show the extent of disease, whether there's uh, any pleural effusion, and also for guiding procedures. At the same time, we also do a lot of work in artificial intelligence, and we we are we already had a pneumonia algorithm which we had built, and now we are trying to you know use that as the base to actually build an artificial intelligence algorithm for COVID-19, which, uh, you know, if someone uses that algorithm, then an X-ray being done or a CT being done, a probability score will be given for COVID-19. The other thing where uh, radiology has played a role is uh, when a RT-PCR test comes negative, but clinically, the you feel that this has to be uh, COVID-19. And that we know that RT-PCR from the initial uh, reports uh, is about 30% false negative. I think it may be closer to 15 to 20% as expertise has increased. And that's one area where you think this is COVID, the RT-PCR is negative, you may do a CT scan. And if there are typical CT lesions seen, then you can say that this is uh, COVID and a repeat RT-PCR in many cases has come out positive. So in a brief, I would say that the diagnostic industry has really risen to the occasion. Both the labs 
with molecular diagnostics. We've also uh, uh, worked with CSIR uh, in, in looking at uh, next-gen sequencing, looking at mutations in, in some of these positive samples. And then on the other side, in imaging, uh, also, we have learned a lot and it can both uh, help in uh, the diagnosis, like I said, where RT-PCR may, may be negative and very, very important in actually treatment of the patient when he's within the hospital and especially when he's in the ICU. Wonderful. Perfect. Uh, thanks for those thoughts, sir. Extremely important, uh, you know, points you raised and uh, probably sets the tone for uh, Dr. Mishra to come in and uh, say, you know, where exactly are we headed in terms of, uh, you know, accuracies of uh, testing techniques, uh, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, people have been talking about lots of, uh, you know, errors, uh, you know, while Dr. Lal mentioned there is no false positive. At the same time, Dr. Mahajan mentioned about 40%, uh, you know, uh, a chance of inaccuracies. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mishra, the floor is yours. Uh, how do you want to describe uh, the past and take it ahead for the future? Uh, thank you. So, uh, uh, I would like just to start like others, uh, that this has been an amazing experience for the academic institutions as well. We have not been doing, maybe CCMB is a, a small exception because we have been doing diagnostic of uh, genetic diseases of certain kind, but not uh, infectious diseases. And today, you can see that uh, hundreds of academic institutions are doing uh, uh, full-time uh, uh, testing diagnostics of uh, COVID-19. So that is an amazing change when these institutions have risen to the occasion where country needed their services. Uh, see, it's not simple diagnostics. See, the, what uh, RT-PCR based diagnosis is quite challenging. That's why you see these issues of false positive, false negative, and so on, because you are collecting the, the swaps and then taking out the virus, uh, the RNA of the virus from that, so making RNA preparation. Then you are converting that RNA into DNA and then you are amplifying that and using several methods of detection. Most of them use fluorescence-based detection. So this is actually very sophisticated molecular biology that uh, uh, you are doing and doing it at this scale that lacks, lacks and a half every day. Now we have reached the, the capacity and as some panelists mentioned, I hope that our capacity will reach to a million and not uh, 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 only five lakh. Because this is possible to do, there are small changes that can be brought in, sensitivities can be improved, and we can, uh, we can take it uh, to the more desired level of testing in this country. Uh, I look at it in a little larger perspective as a how this is going to change our approach to our diagnostics. See, diagnostics in a, in clinicians uh, and in clinical context is opening your eyes and seeing what is there and then take decision based on that. If we don't do correct diagnosis, we'll be guessing and uh, 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 often not giving the best treatment or take best action from as far as the system is concerned, who to isolate, who not to isolate. So now since there is attention for the diagnostic, there is attention for science, that science can give solutions to the problems. I think we are in a very positive direction that diagnostic is getting importance. See, all we are talking about DNA-based diagnostic. There are other diagnostics also, but I focus only on this. This diagnosis, we, diagnostic gives you uh, insight into genetic diseases. Now for cancer, people are using uh, 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 genomics-based diagnostics and prognostic approaches. And of course, infectious disease, we are seeing uh, right in front of us how these DNA-based diagnostics are important. We are also going to go in the same way and using high throughput genomics approaches, which will give us not only diagnostic, but also predictive uh, uh, capacities, which will take us towards the personalized and precision medicine. And these are the very nice things to put in the context uh, where we are today. We have now seen that when time comes, this country can respond to the occasion that we are testing in such a high level. Uh, as you already heard that kit supply has been resolved. There are excess uh, uh, manufacturing of that. The government has also realized that and uh, we are involved in many other activities like indigenization of these uh, uh, materials. Although kits are now indigenized, uh, I mean they are ma manufactured internally, but many of the components are imported still. 
so there is very serious like you've seen this atmanirbhar bharat uh, uh, discussions in the science also at very high level discussions are going on how to make everything indigenous so which means that whether it are chemical biochemicals or whether are these are enzymes which are produced uh, in a recombinant dna approach or small uh, uh, medical devices they should be made internally which will not only help us doing diagnostic as a much much cheaper uh, cost like if everything was internally made the test the rt pcr test can be delivered in less than 500 i'm uh, talking only of uh, recurring expenses of course there are other expenses involved in this and more important than that that nobody can uh, stop us from the supply in the beginning we we are involved in this testing in the beginning and we have waited for kits for days to come because those days there was short supply now we have partly overcome that problem so once we okay. build this capacity this will also help us in doing r and d in more free more uh, convenient more effective way because we will not be depending on importing small little things even you will be surprised even water is imported for uh, doing molecular biology experiments so that is that means we have got lazy it's not that india cannot make if we can send rockets uh, to uh, to uh, to different parts uh, in the in the universe uh, we can certainly make these chemicals and we have shown that this can be done so i think that is a big right. positive that is going to come out of this of course we have to uh, use our product we have to ensure quality because that's going to be the uh, the key point but uh, there will be many positive that come from this fantastic thanks so much sir so we completed uh, one round of uh, our uh, discussions uh, and uh, those views have been really uh, extremely valuable uh, so now you know uh, for the second uh, part of the questions that i will have for all four of you uh you know none of the healthcare systems so to speak have been able to manage this crisis in a good way we've seen the examples of us italy spain all going uh, uk uh, haywire uh, so naturally you know and diagnostics have found a, a a a new found place in in all of this which so much of testing so much of labs coming in news uh you know sometimes pricing sometimes quality sometimes people not getting you know test kits uh, many things we have learnt as part of our overall lessons so my question for the next round will be uh starting again with dr lal you know if you were to do uh or suggest two things for the private sector to do better and for what will be your expectations from the government two or three points each Uh, if you can elaborate thank you vikas so first of all i would like to put on record that the government can worry about anything but they should not worry about the testing part because testing part has really come of age and i am saying this in a very you know nice positive kind of a manner and i am actually overawed by what the what the government labs have been uh, doing and they are really overworked talking about the private sector our uh, you know observation is that the testing criteria was kept very very strict it was kept very tight so for once now since we are now stepping out into the open and saying that well we must test you heard the who boss saying test 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 you even heard you know uh, the president of america trump testing 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 and that's a, if if america comes out of it it is only because of testing and the, trump could not pronounce the word rosh so like a cockroach is a roach diagnostic you know he was saying but the fact of the matter is that with the testing has come of age so after having said that so the first thing i would like the government to do is now to relax the you know very closely net or closely held uh, testing criteria what they call strategy so uh, i mean there, there is i have got a whole list i don't know if you have the time so anybody with ili kind of symptoms now for more than 3 days should be allowed to be tested and all persons with high risk of close contacts of lab confirmed cases this had been you know narrowed down to you know very uh, like co morbidities etc that should be taken away all healthcare workers frontline workers involved in containment or and mitigation of covid 19 all patients or all persons with a travel history of last 14 days not it was used to be only symptomatic i'm saying everybody who comes from abroad should be allowed to be tested this would include migrants and returnees also 
all emergencies and non-emergency admissions to the hospital, which Dr. Arvind Kumar would you know probably uh, say yes to, and also all admissions to hospitals due to medical or surgical or any other reasons. Patient coming for consultation procedures and daycare should be tested if required by the attending doctor. Leave something to the doctor also. If everybody, if everything has to be you know uh, done in, in some other place, well, it's not correct. And also, lastly, not the least, factory workers going back to their jobs. After all, India has to start manufacturing. So, car industry, food industry, pharma industry, te technical parks, etc., etc., even campuses, offices. Now, there has to be some kind of a bigger thinking. Our thinking was very tight that we were so sure that anybody whom we would catch would be able to trace the, the person. I'm not going to get into the debate whether now we have reached the community stage or not, stage three. But irrespective of fact, now we are openly saying, the government is saying that we are going to increase the testing. So you are not going to start, you know, wake up one day and start testing more. You've got to first, you know, change the criteria for, you know, who test. That's part number one. Point number two also is that because there has been so many, you know, twos and fours coming, taking one step forward, half step back, backward, etc. As far as testing was concerned, now all the, those things are hopefully all gone, and now we are, you know, moving forward. With this, what I where I want to bring you now is RT-PCR is the gold standard. There is no doubt about it. But with this now, we have been living with this, you know, kind of a COVID-19. Uh, uh, you know, a problem. So you have got to go to the next phase and start testing the anti antibodies. Now with that, the government is also, or ICMR has now given a paper that yes, antigen testing can be done. So because I'm not going to take you there because it's too technical, you know, antigen should be done first or antibodies, etc. But I think this is to suffice that if you can get antibody testing done on a large scale, people like us who have got, you know, heavy duty analyzers, we can literally do thousands of tests per day. And we can tell you with a very high degree of certainty that this person whose blood we have taken, this is a blood test, by the way. Now there are no more nas nasal tests or uh, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal tests. And that, that chap has got immunity, which means that the, he has been exposed to the virus or he has suffered from it. And he can even be a good candidate to give his plasma for people who need it. So for neutralizing antibodies, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I would like to stop here, uh, food for thought. Right. Uh, one last question, sir, before I uh, wrap this up. Uh, on, on the consumer side, sir, and also I understand the compulsions of your running the business and, uh, you know, investors' expectations. Uh, we saw the first, uh, you know, bar of pricing fixed at 4,500. Then in Maharashtra, it's been brought down to 2200. And still there are issues of affordability. Uh, what exactly will be the solution that you will want to provide so that there is an equilibrium? Yes, uh, because first of all, uh, you know, thanks for asking this, you know, million dollar question. And uh, <laughs> I would like to say that at the time when we fixed the price or the price which was approved by ICMR, was based on a very, very scientific basis. And they went through it line by line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they said, and don't forget, at that point of time, we had never even seen with our eyes, you know, you know what a COVID-19 kit looked like. By the way, when these prices were fixed, and the number of uh, you know people, uh, the suppliers, the vendors, they were just minuscule. And then the Indian suppliers came in, and the uh, so what I'd like to uh, talk about is the pricing part. The pricing was approved. It was absolutely correct. Not only that, if you remember, there was a PIL in the Supreme Court by somebody, uh, Sudhi, Mr. Sudhi, that, you know, it, the testing should be made free. So at that point of time, Supreme Court also went through our line and the said that they also said that what, you know, this, these prices are already approved by ICMR and they did not even bother to go into it. However, now two months or two and a half months nearly have gone in. The prices have definitely come down. The, the number of suppliers have increased. And now we can also say that this kit is, well, it works, but it's not, it could be better, et cetera, et cetera. So we can be choosy. So in that kind of a milieu, we would like to uh, you know, add that, yes, the prices can definitely be brought down. 
question is by how much and there are people you know who who can uh, the uh, uh, don't forget the about the automated uh, you know uh, antibody testing which i was saying we have to shift something you know to that par part also we cannot keep on testing by rt pcr all the time so i think i would uh, you know say only this much perfect right thanks so much uh, for those extremely thoughtful you know observations uh, uh dr kumar uh, you've seen uh, you know and um, you've been really busy uh, hands full uh, your thoughts sir on on where exactly do you think uh, you know you should give a couple of suggestions on how the private sector can uh, you know be better prepared and uh, you know you've seen uh, the the videos that have been actually doing the rounds and how well can we actually be more prepared because we don't know as bill gates had said in 2016 we didn't know about the pandemic and we don't know when the next is going to come your thoughts sir because first of all continuing with what i said in my previous uh, uh, answer that i for one actually do not believe in separating these two into separate silos because they are basically part of the system which caters to the same population a certain uh, number of people from that population go to one and the other go to the other one is funded by public and other is funded by private so the one of the main things that is where private sector excels over the government sector excepting institutions like aims is that the infrastructure that is available in private sector is of the highest quality you know the very fact that they are in that niche segment means that in terms of infrastructure whether it is icu management or the wards or the uh, you know the preparedness of the staff or the whole system the laboratory services the kitchen services the support services the clinic services everything from a to z all those systems which constitute ultimately into a hospital each one of them is million times better in private sector than in government sector there is no i mean there is no disagreement there cannot be and as you mentioned we've seen a video which had compared the level of prepare i don't want to go into individual names i would just say a government facility versus a private facility and the reasons are not far to seek you see if if the government thinks that ordering the ms of a hospital that we want you to become a 2000 bed facility in the next four days time if you pass an order and i as an ms received that order what would i do i would just get the beds from somewhere and put those beds but remember beds don't constitute a hospital there is a lot more that needs to go on the bed especially in a pandemic like like covid where only serious patients are coming to hospital you need to have a monitoring system you need to have trained nurses you need to have trained doctors you need to have a full backup system monitoring system backup system so if the patient has a complication patient can be you know sent to a uh, icu and then of course it comes back so that whole system is needed which today as you can see is existing and beautifully functioning in all private hospitals in delhi it's also beautifully functioning in places like aims and subdivision hospital but i don't know if the same level of functioning exists in other hospitals belonging to delhi government right and i'm saying this in a very unbiased way based on reports from the videos as well as my own i also have friends there i also talk to them i'm fully aware of the problems they are facing you know they themselves feel so helpless they say what can we do if we are just told to convert a big hall into a 100 bed ward with no backup finances given to us they are not going to get the bed sheet and the ventilators from their personal expense somebody has to foot that bill and if you don't foot that bill and just expect them to deliver i think it's a wrong expectation so where okay. private sector can chip in and i come back to my previous talk is to have a synergy see the number of manpower available in government sector is huge it's grossly underutilized the people in private sector number wise are fewer but probably they are today running many times more number of active functional covid beds than are being done overall total in government sector and i think there could be a strong synergy where you know in terms of expertise 
the private sector. Suppose we have excellent ICU facilities and hospital A has a facility where some area can be converted into I ICU. We are very happy to you know, share the experience with them so that they also start making similar facility. If they have some extra residents, they could be made a part of our system. Overall aim is to have as many number of observation and ICU beds available side by side equipped with having sisters, nurses and doctors also available. Now, I want to mention about this move to convert hotels into hospitals. I don't think it's a bright move at all. If you talk to hospitals across the city, each private hospital with the present number of COVID beds that they have is facing the uh, manpower crunch because all the doctors are now doing regular. And remember, when you are in the ICU or COVID ward, you are in PPE and you do maximum six-hour shift. So people are doing, you know, six-hour shifts. So four shifts are running every 24 hours. And when you finish this six-hour shift in PP, because see, you feel absolutely drained, exhausted. You know, you, you just go home and drop dead. It's so bad. So when you do it over and over for 10, 15 days, there is an exhaustion. A lot of temporary staff have left these places. So we have manpower crunch. So now you suddenly tell me that I have to manage a 500 bed hotel. Where am I going to get the doctors and the nurses to go there and manage? I'm finding difficult to manage my own beds. So these are things where I think we need to, instead of just passing orders, you get an order in the evening that from next 48 hours, you're supposed to be running this hotel. So instead of that, I would strongly through your program recommend that the need of the hour is for the, the political leadership, the bureaucracy and the technical people, the, the healthcare sector to sit together, discuss, find out each one's strong points and negative points. So strong point, you help the other one. Negative point, you try to cover with the other one so that overall, each of these becomes an efficient, effective functioning unit, thereby delivering care to the people of the city. Because Absolutely wonderful to hear those thought processes, sir, because I mean, that's exactly where I think things should be headed uh, in, a, in a more collaborative way. And, uh, you know, before I forget, sir, I mean, uh, gratitude to all, all the healthcare workers, the doctors to be actually doing such uh, fabulous work. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we don't know how much to express our gratitude because, you know, speaking and talking about issues from outside is one thing. And, you know, when we see those doctors actually completely drenched with sweat uh, in PPEs, I mean, it really goes, uh, you know, uh, uh, far, far, far in terms of expressing exactly what they are going through and still not giving up. So uh, wonderful to have those thoughts, sir. Uh, uh, may I have Dr. Mahajan uh, come in uh, now on the, on the processes to be followed? Probably, you know, uh, uh, imaging has actually been a revolutionary change uh, and going forward also, I think we've just seen so many large companies actually talking so much about uh, imaging. And again, you know, COVID has not left a single uh, sector untouched. Uh, your thoughts are on exactly where you think we should be uh, bracing up for the future challenges. I think on the imaging front, uh, you know, the constraints of capacity are not so much. The constraints are more from the point of view of, uh, you know, patients who are coming to an imaging facility, an imaging department in a hospital, which is so-called non-COVID hospital, not ending up, you know, infecting other patients or infecting the healthcare workers. So towards that, our working has really undergone a, a dramatic change and especially in this uh, uh, scenario where there are so many positives that you have to think of every patient coming into a hospital with or without symptoms for any disease to be a potential COVID carrier. So that's how we are having to treat every patient. And uh, with that, you have to take all those precautions when they enter your lab, or enter your uh, center, 
how your uh, personnel handle them, how you actually uh, have changed your working so that you know the uh, CT room or the MRI X-ray room is lying free, so that the patient actually comes in quick, gets the scan done, and is out of the department, so that the possibility of spreading an unknown infection is very small. How the healthcare worker, the technologist, the radiologist actually handles the patient, especially when you're doing something physically like an ultrasound. And uh, also the whole sanitization process after every patient using everything which is disposable, disposable sheets, disposable gloves, uh, sanitizing your equipment. So it has been uh, a huge learning uh, process and it's a very tedious process. And we are also present within COVID hospitals. And there your staff has to be in a certain kind of PPE because these are all COVID patients who are coming in. And then again, that uh, you know, shortage of people. And also, uh, uh, Vikas, you have to believe me when I say that uh, many of uh, the, uh, uh, young technologists, lady technologists, somehow, you know, it seems to be uh, a more with lady technologists, lady radiologists, probably because of pressure from home, possibly because they have young children, they have in-laws who are elderly, many of them are wanting long leaves. And some of them uh, uh, in, in the lower uh, paying jobs are just walking off, just as Dr. Arvind said about uh, you know, uh, uh, the shortage of manpower. So at a time when you can use the manpower for fixed hours, and if your existing manpower is going to leave you, then there's a problem. And so I agree uh, with Dr. Arvind that, uh, you know, setting up a new hospital in a large tent or in a five-star hotel or even in a, a railway wagon is very easy. All you need is money and the components to set it up. But getting trained manpower to be able to handle them, because ultimately don't think there'll be just 10 patients there or 20 patients there. If we see the, way, the trajectory that this disease is taking in some cities, large cities, including Delhi and Mumbai, then everything you build will end up getting filled. And so you suppose it's someone with a mild disease, because these are the people who will end up in uh, hotels. Probably that person may be better off isolated at home, where he is cared for much better than in a hotel or a sarai or a tent or a railway wagon. So these, of course, we have to create capacity, but without uh, uh, adequately trained manpower, be it even, uh, you know, fourth or final year medical uh, students, they can do only that much and not more. Yeah. And, and so these are challenges that we are facing. Also in radiology, we've seen reports uh, all across uh, the world, people claiming we've developed a, a AI algorithm, which is 99.8% accurate. That's just not possible. This is all bunkum. And I would say that, uh, you know, the lay media should be aware and should not publish things like this. Recently, we had this, uh, you know, huge news across the country in all uh, uh, the uh, print media about one city where uh, doctors have undergone a CT scan and that nearly 60% of them were positive on the CT scan for COVID-19. Yeah. I mean, that would be a hugely alarming thing. So we know for sure that somewhere overdiagnosis is happening. And also the fact that we have to follow national and international guidelines. We cannot, you know, start making our own guidelines and say, this is what I do in my hospital because of this, this, this. It cannot be empirical. It cannot be anecdotal. It cannot be based on my experience of so many years. That doesn't work. And this is where I come to another very important point, which is that data collection, data collation, 
and data analysis about covid 19 unfortunately sorely lacking in our country the csir is cognizant of it they are trying their best in fact we work with them we built a website where uh, all data can be uploaded but you know the desire amongst the managers the doctors uh, is just not there and we are going to lose precious data if we don't collect it as we go along because from this data we will get pointers as to which is the best test we keep touting the fact of one paper which came early on from china which said that uh, you know 67% is the sensitivity of rt pcr why don't we have our data when we are doing one and a half lakh tests every day similarly you know about treatment protocols some protocols are being followed some trials are being done but we have thousands of patients now over a lakh active patients we need to i, I would stress that this is very very necessary and this is where again dr arvind talks of public private partnership as he defines ppp i define ppp also as private private partnership i can tell you even private institutions work in silos and sharing of data doesn't happen there also if that were to also happen i think uh, we have the mother load of data available with us which could hold us in good stead uh, for many years to come to develop cheaper alternatives to develop cheaper therapies cheaper ways of diagnosing all that can only come from india because we are financially constrained uh, economy our people are poor 4500 uh, what is charged for a rt pcr maybe the lowest anyone charges in the world but for our people it's still very expensive and here i would yeah. also finally expand on a point made by dr arun lal that today it may be possible to lower the rate maybe for large labs which are doing thousands of tests on a daily basis and which have this advantage of volumes it may be possible for them but for smaller labs which do 100 200 300 tests a day it may not be possible we may even be struggling at this figure so when the maharashtra government unilaterally decides that instead of 4500 it will be now 2200 somehow one gets a sneaking suspicion that are they wanting the private sector not to test because there's no way the private sector can test at this level and is it that they want that the number of tests should go down because the public sector also has capacity constraints if number of tests goes down then of course the consequences that number of patients with covid that you report goes down that should right. not be thank you the motive of bringing the price down thank you very much perfect wonderful extremely good point sir and uh, you spoke from the heart and very very important points you made in fact all of you actually touched upon such crucial uh, issues uh, and with that i think you know i'll i'll move to uh, the the final wrap up question uh, to dr mishra i mean you will know sir exactly what it takes to build those capacities in terms of having uh, good test kits self sufficiencies we actually were struggling to get the first lots from you know korea from germany and uh, it was completely chaotic uh, your thoughts sir on exactly what we need to do to kind of really become scientifically more oriented uh, dr mahajan mentioned about the crucial point of data uh, you know earlier on uh, in one of the interviews i heard dr arvin kumar saying that you know just to say that you know you convert a ward into a covid ward is not as easy because you need to have a reverse air flow you know a lot of things need to be changed in your thoughts sir on exactly you know how can science come into the picture how can government labs really become you know the mits the harvards you know the kind of systems that we see in in large uh, you know labs across the world in the us more specifically right yeah so that is actually a, a, a very right question to ask and that is where 
the role of uh, 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 academic institution becomes important. I, I agree with Dr. Mahajan, uh, uh, most of these observation and uh, particularly that uh, RT-PCR based tests have uh, 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 limitation of sensitivity. Our own data says that it is close to 30%, sometimes even uh, lesser sensitivity. So that is true, uh, which also means that we know how to do uh, higher sensitivity tests but they have to be put in the proper validation and those sorts of things. And that is where the role of these academic institutions become very important. Because I can tell you, uh, unlike uh, uh, many panelists which, uh, who uh, explained that uh, low paid or temporary staff left, which is correct, they will leave. All the tests in uh, institutions like ours are in institutions that I know in CSR institutions like IGIB, MTech, and many other academic organizations all the tests is being done by the students. They're not employees. They are doing as volunteers. It is so touching and amazing that they came up, they converted the, the whole system, how to handle, we sat down, wrote the SOP, how to handle the thing, because it's after all infectious virus. And they continued doing it uh, until now, it's more than two months past since we are doing it. Why they're interested is, so I'll just bring you, that will give you the flavor, because this is in their, in their nature to ask questions. They keep asking, how to make it safer, why we should collect this in VTM. Is it necessary to have in VTM? This question will not be asked in uh, uh, typical diagnostic labs because they are uh, doing their job and they are doing, uh, giving the results in accurate way and that's it. But these students, uh, once they are done with the thing, they sit and discuss with each other that why it's come in VTM 3 ml. You'll think it's diluted. Why uh, if there are so few positives, 2%, 3% can't be pool it? so much so that they are even asking now, do we really need to isolate RNA from this? When can we do it without that? And all these questions I'm telling you, we have addressed. They were then and we have even ways of doing it. And soon you will see tests which will be far more cheaper. Those who are doing 200, they'll be able to do 1,000. Those who are doing 1,000, if they have NGS facility, they can do then 20,000, 50,000. These are things that take time. Remember that three months ago, we didn't know the name of this virus. And today we are talking with so much in detail about how to handle this. A PhD student doing hundreds of tests every day is amazing. The capacity that has come up and the response, uh, many labs like IGIV in Delhi has made a, a new uh, technique to test, uh, which is called a CRISPR based technique. Uh, uh, it's very efficient. It can be a point of care device and it's taken up by a big industry. Uh, a house and uh, soon it will probably come for validation. So lots of things have changed. So academic institutions have to work hand in hand with the industry. Anything, any development in test, any new thing if we do, there has to be industry partner. Otherwise it will stay in the lab, it will not go very far because students, scientists lose interest after the innovation part is over. Then they are not interested uh, how to take it to market, how to put it to uh, use and whether there is a market or not, how to make it nice looking so that people buy it, all those things. So there has to be industry collaboration along with that. And there are ways of making these tests safer. For instance, if you are not collecting in VTM, if you are collecting dry soil, they are far safer. They can be shifted. Our uh, staff spends several hours every day just to open the vials because they come in very weird <laughs> state. Some are leaking, some are taped like hell. So you have to be double gloves, you are opening each one for half an hour uh, uh, to be sure that it doesn't leak, doesn't spill, doesn't froth and so on. Those kinds. So uh, how to do it safer, how to do it faster, how to do it cheaper, it is possible to do. The, maybe certain countries was affordable, even if the four and a half thousand is cheapest elsewhere in the world. Let's not forget that uh, there was a time when CD we were used to buy for 700, 800 rupees. Now you can buy for 10 rupees. I don't think any, that means there is a way of uh, when there is a market and that's the power of India. We have market for things, we have number. So we can do many things which small countries cannot do. So I think we have lots and lots of uh, uh, positive and lessons to learn from here. And a few things I would like to just uh, 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 add by concluding. One is that when there is demand, when there is a call, uh, academic institutions, have risen to the occasion and the students and postdocs and uh, research fellows who are there for two years, three years have left their job uh, of regular lab work and started uh, doing testing. Then 
academic institution and industry even even uh, i mean i can talk about the csir we are having uh, at least half a dozen very serious uh, uh, interaction with industry where product is uh, either already in the market like for example ventilators or uh, ppes they are already in the market from nal there are several labs which are putting together sanitizers so many other things so then industry coming together and we are realizing that doing sophisticated diagnostic bringing science to medical use will be rewarding and uh, this was there people knew this labs some of the labs were involved in this but now it has got a broader public perception and i'm sure system also recognizes you have heard a little bit uh, how smooth and how uh, uh, easy the regulatory process has become i mean part of some of them decisions are taken within one week things are not delayed so i think these are cultural changes that are bringing uh, it may not be very uh, uh, nice but the, thanks to this virus that many things are changing we are having meeting like this it was not earlier known and uh, we are having very effective interactions all me so i think many things are positive that we can take from here but just to uh, to end by saying that this pandemic has taught us how to look for solutions for the big problems and how to work together it doesn't matter whether you are permanent or temporary whether are you private industry whether you are hospital the number of interaction we have with the hospital all hyderabad hospital we have now mou we are talking to each other we are uh, uh, taking samples we are doing genome analysis to figure out they become curious whether this virus is more dangerous less dangerous. lots of fun coming from this because if doctors so interested in research i think we will change the face of uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, scene in this country which i think is now uh, happening wonderful sir you almost gave uh, me the the conclusive remarks uh, by so beautifully summing up the whole conversation actually i thought you know we, maybe we will have about 35 40 minutes it's so good to you know have this very exciting dialogue with all of you for about 1 hour uh you know uh, starting from uh, dr arvin lal actually reassuring that you know tests are going good and the least that should be worried about are the tests in fact even on the affordability it was so uh, you know encouraging to hear him on that part uh, dr uh, arvin kumar I, you know your your points are very well valid on the on the need to have a combined effort you know rather than looking at things in in different compartments uh, even dr mahajan you know you spoke about data i mean we always have issues with data you know on the on the trust levels and in 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 what way the data is interpreted uh, you know if there is some kind of a transparency that could be built it can actually go a long way in terms of handling the situation well and of course uh, you know uh, dr mishra the wrap up was so beautiful in terms of you know all the scientific establishments we've all been really put to a lot of test compelling test by this one virus and the best will probably come out and in fact you know in all of the gloom when i hear all of you it gives me a lot of hope of a good uh, future which will be in control and probably devoid of the virus in the next couple of months uh, thank you all of you for joining us giving your precious time about an hour in these busy moments so thanks again and uh, hope to connect soon with all of you thank you so much sir thank you many thanks for bringing those insight to our notice and do check out our booth for all the insights and data so remember to explore learn and progress